All right, I'll, I'll get started. I'm the oldest one. So I'm Coach Ron Van Moorkirk. I coach at Wilfrid Laurier University. There I'm the defensive line coach and the defensive coordinator. And I also teach full-time at a high school in Kitchener called Eastwood Collegiate, home of the Rebels. Awesome. DA, you want to go next? Sure. <clears throat> I'm Darrell Adams. I go by Coach DA. I'm the associate head coach, defensive coordinator, recruiting coordinator, University of Waterloo. Uh, originally from Long Island, New York. Uh, graduated from Villanova back in 05. Uh, had a cup of coffee with the Jets. And it was the Ticats that brought me to Canada. And I've been here ever since, 13 years strong. Don't plan on going back anytime soon, especially with that <laughs> knucklehead in office right now. So <laughs> happy to be here. Awesome. Coach Cannon? Yep. Um, Anthony Cannon. Um, from, you know, born in the States, from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, went to Tulane University, uh, four years there, was drafted by the Detroit Lions in 2006, played three years for the Lions, then found my way uh, to the, the Toronto Argos in 2011, played one season for the Argos, and ever since then, I've been uh, coaching football and developing football, uh, had a chance to coach uh, my first opportunity to coach at the CIS level at Laurier. And then from there, I went to U of T. And now I'm currently uh, the player development director at Matrix Football Academy. Awesome. So I was super excited to to get these three guys on. You know, I was actually playing when, when Coach Cannon was coaching at Laurier. And obviously, I've spent a lot of time with Ron. And seeing the work that uh, Coach DA has done at, at Waterloo has been awesome. So we got a bunch of really good questions. I'm just going to kind of roll into it and we'll get going. Um, you know, everyone talks, especially in the Canadian game and, and D linemen are always talking about pass rush for you as a coach, what are kind of the three things or, or, you know, the, your biggest priorities when you're looking at a pass rusher, what do you think the three things are that help, you know, guys be successful the most, uh, coach can, do you want to take that one to start? Yeah. I mean, so I say the three things I'm looking for in a pass rusher. Uh, first thing I'm looking for is, is their get off. Um, uh, you know, are they able to change the change the line of scrimmage and, and reestablish a new line of scrimmage. Uh, the name of the game is getting the backfield. So that's the one thing I'm looking for. Uh, second thing I'll be looking for is um, their, their, their balance. You know, if they have good balance, uh, they're not able to get knocked off their rush a lot. Uh, and if they're disciplined in, in that regard. And the third thing I'm looking for is just a motor. Uh, you know, how, how, how bad does that rusher want it? You know, is he, is he chasing down the play from the backside? You know, things like that. Those are things that are uh, non-talented issues is what, that we're talking about. And, you know, it doesn't take any talent to to show those three things when you're looking at a film. So uh, those are things that I, I try to focus on and as more so than skill. Awesome. Coach DA? Yeah, just to echo that sentiment in regards of the things beyond talent, you know, one of the things I talk about is, Knowing yourself, knowing who you are, you know, if you have the biggest, strongest, fastest, or if you're undersized, know who you are, know what your strengths and weaknesses are, know what you bring to the table. That will help you develop your game overall. And speaking specifically of pass rush, understanding what's going to be your bread and butter. If this fourth quarter game is on the line, what are you going to be able to do to make the play? And the second thing would be to know who your opponent is, okay? You know, pass rush is an art. So you got to be able to study and evaluate film and figure out kind of what the uh, offensive lineman is going to do, how he's going to set you, you know, is he patient? Is he going to be able to bait you? Does he mix things up? You can't just bully everybody. You got to be able to, you know, have a vast array of moves. So knowing your opponent will help you be a dominant pass rusher. Awesome. Coach V? Yeah, I think the one thing that I'll look at uh, before we get started is length, right? So, you know, with the quick game, we see so much quick game at the U sports level. You do need some length because the ball will be out so quick. And we want to, we always want to say we want to cloud that picture. We want to muddy the, the vision of the QB. So, you know, that length, and then, I, you know, I'm just adding to what Coach Cannon and Coach DA talked about where they're talking about, you know, know your skill set, and then kind of those non-talent items where, you know, your effort, your motor, your get-off, all things that you can work at. Um, but, you know, one thing I do like is a real tall, long pass rusher to cloud that vision of that QB. When he's doing that read and he's pulling that ball out, Sometimes you don't get a chance to get there, but you certainly can. If you're a little bit taller than the next guy, that certainly can help you. Yeah, I think it's something that, you know, as an offensive lineman, it, that's where I play the game. Oftentimes you see those really good pass rushers, and the, the thing that I always found to separate the good ones from the great ones is that that 
factor that has nothing to do with talent you guys talked about, which is that hustle piece. Or like I remember playing guys that you know might have unbelievable moves and look great in one on ones, but they're just not as productive as you think. Whereas if you think of all the really good guys, you know, making a difference in the OUA right now, um, you know, those guys are all are all hustling and you know not leaving anything left on the table. Um, in terms of as a pass rusher, when you're teaching your guys and you know you're looking at the offensive lineman in front of you. What are you kind of reading as a pass rusher or coaching your guys to read as a pass rusher in terms of what move you choose to do? Obviously, you might have you know a move in, in your mind that you're going to use pre-snap, but what are you looking at in an offensive lineman, whether it's their body position or their set, that might you know help you decide what move to use or, or what kind of counter to use? Coach V, do you want to start with that one? Well, I'm going to... Uh, before we get my answer here, you know, I want to let everybody know I'm a Coach Cannon disciple. I, mean, I learned <laughs> most of what I know about pass rush from Coach mm-hmm. Cannon. So, you know, when I heard him talking about, you know, reestablishing the line of scrimmage and that get off, remember the first time I was running, watching Coach Cannon run drills for us, that's, you know, that's the first thing he worked on, that fundamental was the get off. So uh, for us, you know, we kind of want to make sure that we're reading the set. Are we getting a long set? If we're getting that long set, you know, then our pass rush is going to be determined on that. If we're getting a short set, our pass rush has to be determined by that set. So, you know, read the set. That's the first thing we're looking at. And then the next thing that we like to look at is how they work with their hands, right? Are they are they heavy punchers? Do they punch from, you know, the, you know kind of their crotch line up? Are they punching from out? And if you can kind of get a sense then, as Coach Da was talking about film study, how do they how do they like the block? And then you know, you got to be ready. And you know, what like we always say at, at Laurier because I learned it from Coach Cannon. All right, let's let's make those O linemen uncomfortable with our get off and really close that distance and you know take away that yard that they get. For sure, Da. For sure, just building off what Coach said. You know, I'm, <clears throat> I agree that that first step is important because. You know, it's it's a race to the quarterback. And I tell my guys all the time, we're faster going forward than they are going backwards. So if I can get that first step in the ground and threaten him vertically, now I can give myself a chance to beat him around the edge. Like Coach V said, if I'm reading his set, if his shoulders are square, I'm going to attack half the man. I want to be able to pick a side and go half the man and never down the middle because now we're in his wheelhouse. So if I can threaten him to get him to, to choose a set, it's going to help me be able to decide what move I want to do. If he wants to short set, I got to get into my quick game right away. So quick, heavy hands and be able to understand what type of escape to use based on how he sets you. Awesome. Coach Cannon? Yeah, it's going to be hard backing those two up. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm i just going to, you know, echo you know, what Coach D.A. and what Coach V said, uh, that that get off is important. And if you if you have the same get off every time, uh, that, that lineman is going to have to, you know, declare what he's doing a lot sooner. Uh, but the one thing that I would say to any pass rusher is make sure you have your counter move ready. Because, uh-huh. uh, I mean, guys, you know, the old linemen, I mean, as you know, old, old linemen, they, they, they have skill as well and, and they have technique. So, you know, to, it's not a crime that I always was taught, at, uh, especially by Rob Marinelli in, in, um, you know, in Detroit. He's, a, he's in Dallas now. I don't really know if he's still in Dallas. They've had a little – shaking up of the staff there but one thing he would always teach the guys is you know it's not a crime to, to get blocked it's a crime to stay blocked right so uh they may block your first move but you better make sure you have a counter move ready mm-hmm. uh and that's that's really when you win a lot of a lot of pass rushes are won off that counter mm-hmm. so i mean that, that that would be one thing that i would say you want to make sure you have your counter ready to go yeah, and that's that's one thing, again, as an offensive lineman, when I think back to the good pass rushers I played against, you know, you'd feel like you were barely done beating their first move and they're already into their counter, right? Like, you never really felt like you had them blocked. They're, you know, recognizing the set like you guys talked about and, and getting into that second or third move. Um, the next question is a little more run game focused, and, and I know it's something that, that we see a lot in our league, but um, if you're coaching a D lineman or really any edge player, uh, and they're getting a kick out block from either a pulling guard or a fullback. So not, you know, not a base block from the tackle, but the tackle's blocking down and you're getting the, the puller on counter or, you know, maybe a fullback on split zone. How do you guys kind of teach, you know, your defensive ends to play that in terms of, 
you know, what responsibility do they have, but also like what technique are they using to, to kind of protect themselves in that situation? Uh, Dia, you want to take that one first? Yeah, sure. So let's talk about the fullback first. Cause there's a mentality that I have with my guys. And I say this <clears throat> never, ever in the history of football will a receiver uh, fullback <laughs> or tight end block a defensive end. It's not going to happen. That's the mentality you take from day one. You are not getting blocked by a fullback, tight end, wide receiver. So get that on your head right now. In terms of pulling old linemen, okay, we'll do three different things to take on the pullers. The first one we'll do is we'll play a hammer technique where the defensive end is going to square up with the offensive lineman, hit him thick on the upfield shoulder and keep his outside arm free. The point of that is to make sure that the ball's being funneled inside to the backers and insert their gap. The next thing we'll do is we'll play a spill technique, and now the DM will take his wrong shoulder, he'll hit the old lineman thin on the inside half, the score up inside to make the ball bounce outside to the backer scraping over top, and he'll play the inside gap if the run stays inside. And the last thing we'll do is just we'll cut him, you know, just to make a pile in the backfield. You know the old saying, penetration kills the run. If they're trying to pull an add extra gap to the point of attack, we're just going to cut the offensive line make them tired of getting up off the ground and stop the run in the backfield before it gets started. Coach Ken, anything to add there? I mean, those are all three great points. Um, I mean, those are pretty much the three things that you can do. I've, you know, myself being an edge, you know, rushing off the edge, I've, I've done all three. Um, just to add to it, a lot of those techniques are based upon the call for the defense at that time. Uh-huh. I mean, there's sometimes you're you're in a situation where, you know, knowing the coverage and knowing where your extra defender is or the you know the free hitter is, is going to determine how that that block is taken on sometimes. So, uh, once again, we're talking about the the mental part of the game now, right? And uh, so, all of that goes together when it comes to taking on a block and, and stopping the run because it takes you know 12 hats to stop the run. And you're just one piece of it. So, uh, and, and one more coaching point I would say is, let's say you are spilling or you're, you're wrong, or sorry, or, or you're hammering, you're not giving yourself up. Mm-hmm. To, you're going to go make a play. So if I'm going to go spill the ball, I mean, if I'm spilling the block, I'm spilling the, the blocker to go make a play. All right? So don't ever think that you're just spilling to be a sacrificial lamb. Um, we're all going to go get that ball carrier. For sure. Coach V? Yeah, I, you know, all that fantastic stuff. I think, you know, Coach Cannon, uh, met, you know, talked about it, that it's related to how you're going to play scheme-wise. So if we have an overhang player in the boundary, let's say if we have, a you know, a guard pulling into the boundary, you know, we'll probably want to make sure that we spill it. If we don't have an overhang player in the boundary, we'll probably post it up, and, you know, we want to make sure that that gets funneled. It'll also, too, depend on the tailback. So we're playing a real big, lanky tailback like the kid at Carlton. He's probably, what, 6'2", 6'3", 220 pounds. We don't want him north-south. We want him east-west. So we'll spill all the counters, right, and then we'll track him with speed. So there are lots of things that we'll factor in. And if we have a guy that comes across the formation and loves to cut, uh, I don't love my guys just squaring that up and posting it. I always want those guys to wrong shoulder it so that they can protect themselves. So, you know, that's the other component that you got to think about, how they're going to be blocked. And, you know, I think Coach D.A. talked about it best. Nothing's worse when you see, you know, a D.A. get, uh, sorry, D.N. getting blocked by the slot receiver. I always say, hey, we need a new defensive end. I know that's right. <laughs> that's going to happen. We're going to get a new defensive end. You're going to let that happen. Right, we need new defensive end, and you know you're gonna, you know, is it the fullback? Is it both? And I think the one thing I want to add, if we get both guard and tackle, we want to teach our guys to make sure that we don't want to go one for one there. We want to go one for two. We want to, you know, spill underneath and then push up and still try to get that second puller. Right. So if we're getting two pullers, man, just don't be satisfied taking on the one. Try to get that second blocker as well, and that. You know, that's served us well in the past. For sure. I, I remember, you know, Coach V put me onto a good podcast with Don Brown, and uh, he was talking about that. You know, I don't believe any of my guys should ever lose a one-on-one in any situation, so why we get a puller? Now I'm just going to tell him, yeah, you just go inside of that and, and take that one-on-one. Um, you know, I think that's huge, and there's so many people now running, like, the split zone and the counter-F stuff. 
Um, you know, I think Western runs a ton of it and it's, it's super common, I think on both sides of the border. So, you know, that's important for guys to kind of have in their toolbox, um, kind of a, a recruiting question or phil, phil, or philosophy question here in terms of one tech, three tech, what's kind of like the difference for you guys in terms of what you're looking for, you know, in there's in those players and is there kind of a, a big difference in your scheme? Um, or are they, you know, more similar than, um, that may be different in that case. Coach V, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, Sarah, you know what, like, they've tended to be different, but I, I don't purposely want them to be different, right? We, you know, we like to play multiple fronts, and really, you know, if you just have a one-tech that you're afraid to put into the B-gap on the one-on-one -on -one pass rush, you know, that kind of limits what you can do. So, you know, we don't really set out to say, man, we just want this one person to play one-tech. We want athletic kids who can run, right? So that I have the flexibility that if I want, I can, you know, play a double B gap or a double B technique with my two defensive tackles and I don't have to worry about it. And then I don't really have to worry about subbing them out in, you know, pass rush situations. Now, you know, the one great thing about football, and that's the one thing I love about coaching high school football and football in general, it takes all types, right? It's, you know, so sometimes, you know, you got a kid that probably, you know, is best suited to play one tech, but, you know, I'm not purposely, when I'm out recruiting, saying, oh, that guy's a one tech. I'm just looking for the best football players that, and, you know, that do the, you know, the things that we want them to do the best. But, you know, sometimes they just end up, end up being the one tech, but we just like that flexibility. For sure. Coach, uh, Coach Ken, anything to add there? Uh, I would say whether you're playing one or three, uh, your your mentality is going to be a little different. Um, if you're at that nose, you're at that one technique, you got to expect a double team. <laughs> and you, and you got to appreciate it, right? Um, and also with being an interior rusher, a lot of times, you know, if you have a good nose and that's going to get doubled in that A gap, then that means your defensive end is going to have a one-on-one. -on -one. And with that being said, oh gosh, that end, you know, I like to run, I like to run pass rush games a lot just to confuse the old lineman and, and get you guys kind of, you know, thinking. And when you have an interior lineman, that's a nose that can wrap for contain. Uh, it may, it makes your, your pass rush games a lot more dynamic. Um, when you got someone in the middle that can go run down and, 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 you know, run that alley and make a play. So, you know, I wouldn't have the, the mentality that, hey, I'm a nose guard and I'm going to get as big and, and heavy as possible. No, you want to be as athletic and have the best footwork you can have and have a motor and just know know where your other your other guys are up front so you can cover them. For sure. DA, anything else there? Yeah, we play a 30 on water loose, so I forgot what a three-tech is. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, when we do get to our 40 stuff in terms of recruiting – you know, a three tech is basically a five tech who ate too many Big Macs. You know, he's the same <laughs> body type. He's got that explosive twitch. And the three techs in the league make the most money because they have the closest route to the quarterback in that B gap. If you can find a guy that can speed rush that B gap day in and day out, he's going to make a lot of money and give your offensive uh, line fits. Um, in terms of the one tech, you know, he's a guy that's got to be, you know, tough as an ox. He's got to be cock strong. He's got to be willing to sink those double teams and do the dirty work and get none of the glory, but also be the backbone of that unit to make sure that, hey, you know, we're shutting shit down. You know, we're stopping the run. We're getting after the quarterback. We're just the four of us. We shouldn't need to decoordinate or drop all these funky, fancy blitzes. We can do stunts. We can go vertical rush when our one-on-ones, and we're going to get after. So, you know, for me, if I'm recruiting specifically one and three techs, my three tech is a guy that's going to be speeding the beat, got vertical rush, have a lot of shape. My one tech's a guy that's going to be a bit stronger, a little bit more of a blocky guy, but he has enough athleticism to be moved around and do some things in a twist game like Coach JC was talking about. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it's so interesting now with, uh, you know, how the game's changing and, and a lot more people are going back to the 30 stuff or, you know, it's 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 they're playing with 3D linemen on the field and creating a fourth rusher. Um, you know, it's an interesting concept there. Um Interesting question, and, and you know some of this at the university level, you know might uh, it might be different at the, at the high school level. 
But if you're in a situation, you know, and you're a coach and you know, hey, my D line unit is gonna kinda struggle to hang in with this with this offensive line group, you know, lining up in our gaps and one on one and just trying to be successful that way is, you know, we don't think we match up, you know, really well in that case. Um, what are kind of some advice you'd have in terms of things you could do, whether it's scheme wise, um, or, you know, individually try and have those D linemen do to, you know, help them be successful. If say they're in a physical mismatch in terms of that O line they're, they're playing against, uh, DA, do you want to take that one first? For sure. Um, schematically, you know, you got to junk it up. You know what I mean? You got to show multiple fronts. You got to be able to be diverse in what you do, how you attack the gaps. You know, if you're going to struggle to be gap sound, then you got to be able to get the guys moving and hit gaps from different angles. You got to be able to bring us your guys into the box and not be afraid to play, you know, some cover zero, some cover one on the back end. You know, you got to stop the run. Otherwise, it's a long day at the office. You know, so you got to be able to mix and match, you know, what you do with your, your system. Um, technically, you know, you can, you can cut off this alignment. You can run a lot of pick games. You can design some run specific stunts to be able to penetrate gaps and kill the run before it gets started. And, uh, you know, you got to use your speed. If they're killing you because they're bigger, stronger than you, you got to be able to kill them with some speed. So maybe some edge pressure to dictate, you know, where the ball is going to go and, uh, you know, mix and match how you treat pullers or how you treat the quarterback. If you're getting some sort of a zone read, you know, you know, old school chase shuffle rules, or maybe you throw in a kill technique where you send the edge defender straight to the quarterback and you take away the, the quarterback run. So depending on, what type of runs you're seeing, um, you can design some stuff to help put your players in a position to be successful. Awesome. Coach Cannon? Um, yeah, I mean, those, those are all good points. I mean, when it comes to scheme, uh, when you feel like you're outmatched from a defensive line standpoint, I mean, you're going to have to rely on, on your teammates. Everybody's going to have to just do their job. Uh, but from my experience, movement uh, is, is the best way to, you know, get – you know, to take that that the 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 disadvantage away from from the O line is you start moving because those guys don't like that. So if you're in a For position sure. where you feel like, you know, hey, uh, I'm outmatched here, then to me, speed and movement is the best way to 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 level that playing field. Absolutely, Coach V. Anything else to add there? Well, I, you know, you're going to need multiple looks, right? Like you're just not going to be able to hang in a a base front and and pray that you stop them, you know, by the end of the third quarter, that's over. Uh, you're going to need, you know, you know, a set of things that you feel comfortable with, and then you're going to continue to need escalations. And you're going to have to be comfortable with escalations because how you stop them in the first quarter is probably not going to how you're going to stop them in the third, especially if you're overmatched. So as Coach DA said, you better be ready to escalate and play some zero. Um, you know, sometimes that can be a tough way to earn a living too, but you know, mm -hmm. got to do what you got to do to stop the run. I know that's right. It is what it is, right? Like you, sometimes there's comfort in knowing that you have to do that and you better get good at it. For sure. As a, as an o -lineman, um, you know, myself, I think my mic cut out there as an O-lineman, you know, myself, do you guys ever coach like holding double teams? Um, that was something that always drove us nuts. Um, but it seemed like whenever I watched the team on film, they were having no problems with it. And then we would have, you know, it seemed like they were having no trouble getting to the backer and then you get in the game and, you know, they're holding double teams and it's tough on the inside guys. Do you guys ever coach that or is that, you know, not something you're spending much time on? Coach V? Uh, you know, I've been coaching long enough that I've seen techniques change for, on doubles. Right, so when I first started coaching in the sport level and the zone run game started, everybody was about sink and doubles. Sink the double, sink the double, create a pile, and that's it. And then I think when Coach Cannon came, he was a big believer that the linebacker's job was to peel the double. So, and then he, he always preached, and you know I've preached it since, that if the LB can peel the double, then the D lineman's got to win the one on one, right? Like if you're getting one on one blocks as the D lineman, man, it shouldn't get it doesn't get any better than that because you know as Coach Cannon talked about the one tech and Coach Da talked about the one tech and double. But if we can get that double peeled by the LB filling his gap quick, the DL's got to win. So we don't really practice, you know, holding doubles. We don't really practice sinking doubles. 
No, we just, you know, we'd rather be aggressive at the line of scrimmage, force the, that double off, and then, you know, the linebacker's job to peel that. You know, the challenge is RPOs have changed that philosophy a little bit too because now if you bury backers, they're thrown in behind you. Damn offense. <laughs> yeah. We'll you, know, keep, you, you adjust, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Coach Deer or Coach Cannon, anything to add to that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll add. Um, as a linebacker, um, and you know, Coach Coach D, he, he mentioned uh, when I came to Laurier, that was my main thing. Is uh, I put a lot of I put a lot of the pressure on the backers to be a linebacker. You're basically back in the lineup. So if you got a double team in front of you. Just sometimes showing in the gap is going to make that lineman come off because he has rules too, right? Yeah, for so, sure. So um, not necessarily burying your burying yourself in the gap as a backer, but just showing showing your presence there is going to make that lineman come off. And at that point, the defensive lineman's job is to keep his hat in the crack and fight and just wait for that double team to come off and be ready when it comes off to go make a play. That's the main thing. Be ready. Don't be surprised that the double team comes off. For sure, and I think that put, that puts a lot of pressure on on double teams too. And you know, anytime you can make the old lineman do stuff at a at a tempo or pace that you know they're not comfortable with, I think that puts the advantage on the defense for sure. Um, kind of got a couple questions left. Um, a big one that I got from a few different people was, if you're an undersized pass rusher, you know, and I think a lot of high school coaches, you know, you guys all know it's tough recruiting defensive linemen. There's a lot of undersized pass rushers out there. Specifically for them, you know, what would be your one biggest piece of advice? I know there's probably a lot of stuff you can talk about, but what would be your biggest piece of advice? If you're an undersized guy, what's your best way to, you know, still be effective as a pass rusher? Coach Cannon, you want to take that one first? I'm going to start off by saying, Kwaku Botang. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I had the joy to coach Kwaku as a as a as a rookie or as a freshman at, at Laurier, and he was about 205 pounds soaking wet. Uh, became one of the best pass rushers on the team that year, and it was because of his motor. And if, and if Coach Da, you you said it earlier, uh, you got to know yourself. You got to know, hey, I'm undersized, so I got to bring something else to the table. So. Work on what you're good at and, and continue to develop that. So if you're undersized, speed and quickness is going to be your friend. 100%. Absolutely. DA, I that, that, that one? That, yep, for sure. Don't let undersized be a crutch. It can be a tool that helps you be successful because if you can play with good pad level and leverage, you can get underneath blockers in the run game. You can sink high violent rips under any offensive lineman. And you can have so many counters off your rip. You should know, know what you can reduce the striking surface because of you know how low you are to the ground physically, and you can really give offensive linemen trouble because of your size. You know, maybe you're not getting in the throwing lane if you're quick game things like that, like Coach B talked about. But if you're getting steady dose of straight drop back and you're getting you know seven step drops and the, and the quarterback sticking in the pocket, you have some time to make some things happen in the backfield. You can be an absolute terror in the pass game. So don't let it be a crutch. Find a way to make it a strength and make them adjust to you and how your body is physically structured to be able to manipulate what the offensive lineman does. That's a great point, Coach V. Well, and I think the, the last thing that, you know, if you're that undersized guy, quickness and speed is your friend, but then is your hands, right? Like there's so much you can do as the defensive lineman. And, you know, if you watch Coach Cannon on Instagram, he's always showing drills and things that he's doing with his guys. And they're never in equipment. So if you're an undersized guy, you know, get a couple of your buddies together, watch some of these films, you know, and do some of this handwork and this foot, uh, this footwork. It's a no contact situation, so that you can use your speed, you can use your hand, use your body position, your leverage. All those things can easily be worked on. Uh, undersized, lots of great pass rushers have been undersized. Yeah, and I think you know I remember my my last year playing was was Quaku's first year, and I remember you know two hundred five soaking wet might have been generous, but I remember a couple times in training camp going okay, but I, you know he's going against the rookies and you know he's lighting everybody up, and then you know okay how's he going to do it against the vets? Well, he lit those guys up, and then how's he going to do it in his first <laughs> game? You know I think we were playing Guelph week one that was the first game we of the first Falls era, 
And yeah. uh, I remember a, a great play. I think it was jet sweep. It wasn't pass rush on Alex Charette. And then I was finally like, okay, you know what? I think this guy's just going to be pretty good. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of people talk about like speed and, and, and using that to your advantage. The one thing I'll give a lot of the guys credit for that I've seen in Quake, who's certainly one of them, what coach said there at the end about being able to use his hands and, and, and what coach DA said about taking away that striking surface. You know, I was, you know, working with some of our alignment the last couple years of Quaker's career. And, you know, he, he did such a good job taking his chest and taking that striking surface away. So not only was he flying up the field, you know, like coach DA said earlier, he's definitely faster than us going forward than we are going backward. Um, so we're under that stress already. And then his ability to take that striking surface away, you know, like you said, Coach D, I think that that can become an advantage. So that's awesome there. Um, kind of the last question and, you know, something I think a lot of people are interested in. When you're recruiting defensive linemen and, you know, obviously everyone's system's a little bit different. It might be kind of interesting, you know, hearing different takes on this. But when you're recruiting defensive linemen, what are you looking for? Um, and what can guys kind of do to try and, you know, develop skills that, that university coaches are interested? Coach DA, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, get the guys to go to Laurier. Um, we've, had, we've had a pipeline to the CFL guys that couldn't get in the Waterloo, but we're going to that. <laughs> so, I knew that was coming. I knew that was it, had coming. Come. it had to come. But anyhow, um, Coach AC has been talking about the whole time mentality. You know, I, I recruit the person first, regardless of offense, defense. You know, speaking defensive line, I recruit the person first. Get to know how they're wired. Get to know what motivates them. Get to know what makes them tick. So now when they get to you, you have a fresh, you know, person to work with to be able to mold to help be great you know in terms of the, the instincts just understanding that d lineman get after it every single play you got to have a guy that wants to be that dog every single play no matter the day of the week the opponent the weather he's going to put his hand in the dirt and get after it he might get double team might get cut he might be single block whatever he has a chance to make it a play on, impact on the game every single play a guy that's you know selfless he's going to be able to sacrifice and do what's best for the team but also a guy that really purely loves the game. You know, that's one of the second questions. The first questions I ask, you know, is, is do you love the game? There's a lot of people that like the game, but they don't love the game. You know when guys love the game is the work they put in when nobody's watching. In the offseason, times like this, you know, we're all at home finding ways to work out, you know, home gyms, you know, building stuff out of wood, you know, in-home workouts, using the stairs. This is when you love the game, when you're, you're mastering your craft, in the off season, you know, and doing everything you can to be eligible with your academics, making smart decisions off the field because you're a good person and doing what you can to make sure you're ready to rock and roll when the season comes. So, you know, recruit the person first, you know, we're going to give them all the tools they need to be successful at their position. We just want them to meet us with their effort and intensity and their joy for the game. You know, coach can, I know you work with a lot of athletes in, in high school, so you probably have a unique uh, perspective on that question. What what would you say for the guys you train or or you know young defensive linemen out there? What what are the skills that they should be working on? Um, the, the main thing I, I talk about with my athletes is academics, um, and you know that's the number one thing for me. Uh, you you're, you're playing or you're trying to get a scholarship or you want to go to school. Well, school's first. So just as much as these guys are you know working hard and you know, they want to play football and play football. Sometimes I've seen players not be able to play because they're not eligible. Mm -hmm. uh, or you're not able to go to a school because you, you don't have the marks. So as much as you put, you know, a lot of the effort and time into to developing your, your football skills, make sure you aren't, you aren't missing, the, missing the boat when it comes to academics because that's the number one way for someone to say, ah, we're going to go with this next guy. For sure, Coach V. Yeah, and, you know, I just want to echo what Coach DA and Coach Cannon just talked about. The first time I met Coach Cannon, I said, hey, Coach, how did you end up at Tulane? And the first thing he said is, I went to Tulane to get a great education, right? He, he's not just talking about the value of education right now. He's lived it, right? Like he went from Georgia, he went to, he's at Stevenson, and then ended up at Tulane, and, you know, he, you know he's a bright, talented young man. And same with DA. Those guys live – you know, the educational philosophy, you know, as do I, I live it, you know, I'm a teacher, academics, obviously they got to be first. And then, you know, one thing I want to often tell recruits too is just because you're not a D lineman now, doesn't mean you can't be a D lineman. Uh -huh. So one of the best D linemen I've ever had was Justin Phillips, the kid out of Ottawa. 
um, who ended up playing in Calgary for a long time, he ended up going in the first round in 2006. He was a free safety. I recruited him as a free safety. And then he ate his way into linebacker, and I was like, <laughs> man, those hands and feet, that, he's got to play the end. So, you know, same thing. Like, Kwaku was, you know, you know not, he's not ideally suited as a defensive end, but he worked into it. There are lots of guys that, you know, that have been LBs that we've converted into defensive ends and become very successful at it. So just because you don't think you're a defensive end, that position might suit you the best. And if you're a defensive end, defensive tackle might suit you the best. So I always tell you know, the recruits, don't be afraid that you move up one position. So if you're an LB, you might become a DN. If you're a DN, you might become a D tackle, right? It allows you know, the benefit that you have of speed and athleticism and just sort of stepping it up one particular level and as you say, Jackson, and VA says, if you're, you're a great B-gap rusher, you're one big body closer to the quarterback. So they, we're, you know, we're looking for players that VA said, great character guys, as Coach Cannon says, you know, want to do well in school, take care of their academics, and then you know, want to develop to be real good football players. And you know, that isn't just, you know, oh, I'm going to work hard in practice. There's just a lot more involved than that. Yeah, and I think that's one thing, you know, knowing you you guys and, and seeing some of the athletes you've worked with in the past, I think that the love of the craft becomes so important because in high school, and it's the same with O-linemen all the time, you can basically do one thing right as an O-lineman in high school if you're a 6'3", 6'4", kid, and, you know, your high school career will go pretty well. If you're, a, you know, a defensive end who's got some physical ability, it's probably the same. And one of the things I always give Quaker credit for is, man, that guy was learning from the moment he got here to the moment he left. And, you know, I think there's a lot of guys that, you know, are really successful in high school. And, and a lot of the time they just don't know what they don't know. Right. But when you get to the next level, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out sooner or later, but you gotta be willing to do that. And, you know, like you guys said, it's all about making sure you give yourself as many opportunities as you can, um, by putting yourself in a great academic situation. So really appreciate having you guys on. I know it was super informative for, for the people listening and, and really excited to get this out there to everyone. So thanks guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jackson. Thanks for putting this together. Good to see you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.